I started watching YouTube in 2008 after stumbling onto the site through some random searches on early versions of Chrome. The first channel I watched, Sugar Conroy, came up after I was searching for a clip from Night at the Museum where the totems say, Dum Dum. Yes? You give me gum gum. To Ben Stiller. I started watching Chugga more consistently, with one of my friends in elementary school mentioning him in conversation around a month later. YouTube began to grow and expand more than anyone could have known, leading to almost everyone in school knowing of its existence by 2012. <laughs> I used to have an old PC in my room that I played classic games on, which we later sold off to afford a couple laptops. I talked about my laptop at school with one of my friends recommending using Google Chrome. After a few weeks, I started using the browser to search for random terms, which I guess could be dangerous. I searched for the Night at the Museum clip, and with that, found YouTube. I would use YouTube to exclusively watch Nintendo content. Chugga Conroy, Nintendo Capri Sun, and Proton John became a more occasional situation. YouTube was still growing with only a few channels having more than 80,000 subscribers. I didn't know many communities at the time, but comedy channels like Smosh and Shane Dawson were constantly recommended. The highlight for this year would be Chugga Conroy, a channel I would watch almost daily. Chugga had just started his Paper Mario playthrough when I started watching. His channel was extremely influential at the time, especially due to it being established before the big gaming boom. Using older methods to record his gameplay, Chugga gained a large amount of popularity for his consistency and research on the games he played through. Funny enough, he's playing Paper Mario again on his channel. My lucky, my lucky. Similar to the year before, I mostly watched Nintendo content to start the year. That changed when Minecraft started to be suggested through channels like the Yogscast and Seth Blink. I was sold to the game immediately, watching content from it constantly. To be fair, tons of kids started to be more interested in Minecraft and YouTube going forward. The slightly mature, edgy creators playing the game made it more entertaining. Channels like Uberhaxer Nova and Cnanners began to be my favorites when it came to Minecraft in its early stages. Having great personalities with the game made a more interesting video. Yes, I still watched videos from the Nintendo crowd, but my focus differed significantly. These early videos sparked the gaming boom on YouTube, leading to more users visiting the site. YouTube tried to moderate the sudden influx of viewership by giving select channels contracts. My highlight for this year is one of the biggest channels at the time, Machinima who would sweep through every gaming channel with exclusive deals. This would be called a partnership, where Machinima would take a large amount of the channel's revenue. Machinima would later peak as the fourth largest channel, but their misguided ways to stay relevant would hurt them in the long run. Even though there was so many creators in their doors, most of their major partners would leave by 2018. The partnership plan fell apart and Machinima closed their doors in 2020. This year was more of the same when it came to what I watched. Group channels began to be a more regular situation for creators, with the Creature Hub and early esports organizations growing audiences. One of the main things was collaboration at the time, with many creators starting to develop working relationships when it came to their content. I viewed many of these channels along with many standalone channels. Success was gained on YouTube at the time, with only a few creators having over 100,000 subscribers. Many of the other kids in school mentioned their favorite creators, especially a channel known as Fred. Fred was made by a guy who would chipmunk his voice and act crazy. I started to see this guy as a success, with shows like iCarly having the guy on for an episode. The guy above Fred at the time was Niga Higa. I never really watched what he made, but I was always afraid of saying the front of his username. My highlight for this year is Fred, who kept growing as a channel. 
leading to him being the first user to reach 1 million subscribers. YouTube's popularity with Fred Niga Higa, Smosh, and Machinima caused a large addition to those who browsed the site. Fred was so well liked by the public that Nickelodeon had him sign a contract, leading to three films and a couple of TV shows. After Fred boomed, the guy behind it kind of faded away. Fred would later lose the most subscribed channel title to Niga Higa, who would hold it for a while. I remember inviting my friend over to watch Fred the movie when it came out. Many people saw Fred on live TV, and I was honestly disappointed. I thought a movie with an internet star would improve the public appeal of YouTube, but it was pretty boring. Ray William Johnson was a new face on YouTube, and I thought his work was awful at first. It felt like an internet recap show instead of anything special or creative. Equals 3 was a show that he would do consistently, with many people seeing what I think would have been labeled as an early react channel. As Fred's uploads started to be less frequent, his channel fell down the ladder considerably. By the end of the year, Ray William Johnson would be in the top five channels on the site. My highlight for this year is the Rad Brad, with his commentary walkthrough of Saints Row the Third being the first series I would watch from him. He would later play Bioshock Infinite and Last of Us all the way through. His more recent walkthroughs have shown his commitment to showcase the games he plays, with his God of War Ragnarok series being a great watch. The Rad Brad continues to entertain all his viewers, and I hope to see more from him. The gaming boom led to many more channels focused on one game being promoted more on the front page. Channels like Vanoss Gaming, Sky Does Minecraft, and PewDiePie began to be widespread to several people. The easiness of recording something and editing out awkward pauses made thousands of videos revolving around gaming more normal. Most of these channels would upload daily, which would increase the reach of their content. The frequency of videos definitely made it more interesting for me. The boom also caused other creators to make their own channels, where they played games constantly. Toby Games and Smosh Games began to be extremely popular. The idea to have a group of friends uploading videos from the same session but from different perspectives also became possible. I didn't know about Vanoss Gaming until November of 2012 where he constantly uploaded gameplay from Call of Duty Black Ops 2. The highlight for 2012 is Vanoss Gaming. The group he recorded with all the time had separate channels leading to multiple standout creators. His friends, I Am Wildcat and Dahi Dinogla, became extremely popular in the following years. I know Vanoss still uploads, along with most of his friends from 2012, but not at a daily basis. His Black Ops 2 and Gmod videos were some of the most entertaining to watch. In 2013, the battle for the most subscribed channel would change hands to the comedy channel Smosh. I remember watching most of their videos at this time, so seeing them reach 10 million subscribers was amazing. Minecraft's popularity began to wane during this time, causing many creators to quit or change what they played. More genres began to be promoted, leading to more viewers joining the site. Google Plus began to be shoved into the audience's faces, especially when told you needed a Google Plus account to comment on videos. Many creators saw this as a turning point for YouTube, especially with many TV channels and film companies taking up the trending section. I remember that whenever you browse through the trending section, barely any site made creator was put in. Content started to be aimed against YouTube and Google Plus, creating a disconnect between the company and the viewer. The highlight for 2013 is Smosh and Smosh Games. Smosh grew to have the largest of any audience this year, creating a side channel to capitalize on the gaming audience. Important shows like Grand Theft Smosh and Game Time with Smosh came around early in the channel's lifespan. Smosh continues to be a large channel, despite their content getting little amounts of viewership. 
gaming boom continued without Minecraft in 2013, leading to more games being pushed to the audience. One of these games was Slender the Eight Pages, a game where you would search around a very dark map for several pages while being stalked by the Slenderman. Channels like Markiplier, Jacksepticeye, and PewDiePie began to be very popular. PewDiePie was so popular, in fact, that he usurped Smosh as the most subscribed channel before the end of the year. I didn't like his content at first, but his personality grew on me. 2014 was a great year for gaming creators, especially with PewDiePie holding the number one spot for the entire year. Channels that I previously mentioned, like the Radbrad and CNNers, began to have more views than before. There were also channels that focused on reacting to other people's videos, like the Fine Brothers channel and Jinx. Many saw this content as lazy, along with the excessive amount of prank videos on the site. This would spark the creation of many commentary channels that would critique and bullet point issues that the content had. PewDiePie is my highlight for 2014, reaching 20 million subscribers early in the year. He branched out to games other than horror to great success. PewDiePie's 2014 was so great that he was put on certain shows to showcase his personality and interests. I watched him constantly that year, seeing how much better he made his content. The gaming boom carried PewDiePie to hold the title for around six years, with each year having better work than the last. Commentary channels began to be a big deal in 2015, with iDubs and H3H3 Productions having impressive videos attacking other creators for how they appealed to their audiences in a manipulative way. Other channels in the same community, like Leafy is Here and Pyrocynical, began to show other creators in a negative way. Drama channels began to grow to display the opinions of these creators, leading to Drama Alert creating more buzz about the inner workings of the community. Several users, including myself, began to be sold on drama content, leading to these channels skyrocketing in viewership. Family channels, react channels, and prank channels were quickly lambasted for their exploits. Several gaming channels also grew concerned, along with musicians and comedians being criticized for their prior work. Older channels like Shane Dawson, Onision, and the Fine Brothers were attacked constantly for how their prior content looked in light of their characters. It was insane to see the change in YouTube's atmosphere at the time. The highlight for 2015 was iDubs and H3H3. They would research and expose channels constantly to change the atmosphere on YouTube. With deep digs on Prank Nation, SoFlo, Antonio, and Jinx, these two channels became very popular to a wide audience. I recall many gaming and comedy channels being under fire by others in the commentary community, leading to several users leaving the site as a whole. Idubs still uploads, with his video known as Getting Away With It being polarizing due to the character in question, Sam Hyde, essentially pranking him the entire time. H3H3 doesn't upload much, with his podcast taking up most of his time now. 2016 was a great year for growth on YouTube, with PewDiePie reaching 50 million subscribers standing out. The amount of viewership became surreal, with many more genres developing interests. As the classic React family and prank channels went away, a strange line began to occur in the commentary community. After many found reacting to videos as an easy way for revenue, some commentary channels began to review and watch shows without any cuts. I remember witnessing the commentary community quickly become more splintered as they started to attack each other. Pyrocynical started to make gameplay commentaries discussing some of the drama between channels, slowly leaving the community as a whole by 2017. Leafy is here and iDubs had a small feud that ended with Leafy being blacklisted by YouTube. 
H3H3 and Trauma Alert's Keemstar started a fight with words as well. As the commentary community fell apart significantly, other genres began to be more popular. Pyrocynical is the highlight for 2016, due to him stepping away from all the drama he was around. Instead of starting a feud, Pyro slowly went to gameplay commentaries and game reviews. He also streams every week on a second channel he's made recently. Pyro has started making hour-long videos on certain topics that I'd recommend. Even though his Utopia video is seven hours long, it is one of the most interesting videos I've watched. <laughs> Early into 2017, a lot of Twitch.tv users started to upload on YouTube. Despite having their own sphere of drama at the time, these new channels would upload cut-up portions of their streams multiple times a day. I recall watching an early adapter called Soda Poppin, who would upload World of Warcraft and gambling videos on YouTube pretty consistently. There was also an interest in people who would open cases in CSGO, or Counter-Strike Global Offensive, which would later expose T. Martin and the Pro Syndicate as owners of CSGO Lotto. Drama was still great appeal for YouTube and Twitch, leading a Twitch user, Ice Poseidon, to stream Pokemon Go outside of his home. Ice Poseidon would find great success, which would lead to Twitch creating the IRL section on their site. The new medium led to several YouTube users clipping and sharing all of the drama on Twitch, leading to an overlap. I also know that this year would also be the time of Vine Invasion, creating even more overlap and drama. The highlight for 2017 is Soda Poppin, who led a new wave of viewers to Twitch and YouTube. Being able to merge audiences created an interesting situation where some users on YouTube would start a Twitch account to watch the creator live. I remember Soda losing tons of money gambling which was roughly 99% of the time. Soda still streams, now under the OTK organization, playing a variety of games to an audience of 20,000 viewers. 2018 was the year of many things, with makeup and challenge channels rising in popularity. I remember Dude Perfect growing an enormous audience, with many others starting to make videos similar to Mr. Beast. Big companies like the WWE and the NFL gained massive amounts of subscribers. YouTube's creative juices were at an all-time high, with older channels like Jax Films and Good Mythical Morning finding their footing. The personalities on the site became larger, with Logan and Jake Paul leading the charge. The Paul brothers were in controversy after controversy, with many of the remaining commentary channels making a fuss about their antics. I remember watching smaller Vine stars turn their channels into successful commentary channels, including Cody Ko and Drew Gooden. There was also an increase in the amount of podcasts and long-form videos which continue to be very popular. The change in culture on the site led to Google Plus being removed from it, leading to more users joining throughout the year. The highlight for 2018 is Nakey Jakey, whose commentary about video games made many people appreciate the effort. The amount of work Jakey put into his editing placed him in a league of his own. Not many people can top the way Jakey used green screen and captions to create comedic moments throughout their videos. He still makes content with his latest video about esports being a favorite. Jakey also makes music, releasing the album Romcom last year, which I highly recommend you listen to. Girls by getting friend zoned into 2019 was a weird year that saw PewDiePie finally lose the number one spot to T-Series, an Indian music channel that rose exponentially within the last year or two. I read that YouTube established itself as a mainstay on the internet, being the second most used site ever. Sports, gaming, comedy, and drama channels took up more viewers, and Minecraft resurged as the top game to play. A Twitch streamer named Call Me Carson made several videos on his own server, which caused his channel to grow very quickly. 
I remember that the use of nostalgia became a large part of the year, with many gaining popularity coming from older franchises. Film critics, podcasters, and speedrunners became more prominent in the space. The older commentary channels went away from the drama, with many smaller creators picking up the practice. Several users started to migrate to the streaming service Twitch for income. Pay Money Wubby and Critical were two channels that saw significant success elsewhere. My highlight for this year was Call Me Carson and the revival of Minecraft. Carson was a Counter-Strike channel, although I didn't watch until he started to upload Minecraft content to his second channel. He had multiple videos where he would introduce friends and acquaintances from Twitch to a large audience creating even more of a merge between the sites. Carson still uploads despite some setbacks, with Minecraft continuing to be a popular game. Well, besides the obvious, 2020 was a year like no other. Many channels worked on expanding their audience this year, with many viewers fluctuating between YouTube and Twitch. I saw many streamers become more popular to the site, with many finding success, Ludwig, Hassan Abi, and Asmongold found great success uploading portions of their streams in separate videos. As the virus continued to ravage the world, more creators played with streamers on the likes of Among Us and Grand Theft Auto V, where they would roleplay as other characters. A lot of Twitch personalities made a major effect on YouTube, leading to YouTube gaming being established. YouTube bought up some of the larger creators and put them on their new service. The likes of Dr. Disrespect, Tim the Tatman, and Valkyrie jumped ship, leading to some unrest in the Twitch space. YouTube also saw the likes of Markiplier and Jacksepticeye bringing in more subscribers. The highlight for 2020 was the streamer Jay Schlatt, who made appearances on many streams and podcasts with great success. Jay Schlatt was a part of OTK, and he didn't stream on Twitch at all until the end of the year. His connections on Twitch and YouTube created an interesting audience. Despite some ridicule from the Minecraft community, he produced two great podcasts as of recent. Chuckle Sandwich and Sleep Deprived are great to listen to, especially seeing the differences between Schlatt and his co-hosts. YouTube continued to share space with Twitch creators, along with the rise of competitor TikTok. Older channels like Rhett and Link began to gain consistent viewers, along with videos reacting to other people's content yet again. I watched many film, music, and gaming critics begin to work on hour-long videos. Podcasts continued their viewership with many creators establishing their own brands. I remember that organizations like OTK, Envy, and 100 Thieves started to grow. Minecraft continued to have great viewership as well. Comedy channels started to bottom out, with Smosh and College Humor having major declines in viewership. Drama also took a hit unless you were a Twitch streamer. Pranks, React channels, and even food-related content saw a lack of interest. Tier lists and capitalizing on trends began to happen more consistently. My highlight for 2021 was the creator Ludwig, who streamed himself for a month straight and cut content from every day on his YouTube channel. I like that even though Ludwig mainly used Twitch, his ability to make several shows made him valuable. YouTube later hired Ludwig onto YouTube Gaming at a large price. Ludwig has maintained his work creating a successful podcast channel and running a successful chess boxing event live to his channel. Some drama happened throughout 2022 when it came to Twitch, with many big stories coming through the pipeline. Creators like Mizkiff, Rich Campbell, and XQC, in some cases, had major problems and couldn't recover fully. Several YouTube channels also had issues, with many corporate channels dropping creators. The likes of Rooster Teeth and 100 Thieves had major firings, causing a lot of drama. Many foreign creators caused a splash with several kids' channels as well. 
Many communities started to go away from the spotlight, with many more comedy and corporate channels falling apart. I saw Twitch channels and YouTube gaming channels, however, gaining many viewers. A Twitch streamer named Cutie Cinderella created the Streamer Awards, an annual show showcasing the best from the live streamer community. My highlight for 2022 is Cutie Cinderella, who presented a great show for the entire streaming sphere. She did several smaller events, including Master Baker and Sh Camp. She has also hosted several podcasts, including Wine About It and Fear And. I thought that the use of several creators from both Twitch and YouTube gaming had led to more people turning into her streams. Cutie has just finished working on the second annual Streamer Awards with Valkyrie as her co-host. Several creators that use both Twitch and YouTube continue to prosper. Mr. Beast has become a hot commodity, gaining more subscribers than PewDiePie. PewDiePie has quietly retired from YouTube, only uploading a few times every month or so. I like to see the many channels that still capitalize on the past, along with many creators starting off of great promise. I find it interesting on how YouTube changes, especially with the growth the website has had. Many younger creators have found success as of recent, along with great ideas. The genres on YouTube have boomed significantly, with many taking up the streamer content creator 50-50. As of recent, YouTube has introduced YouTube TV to combat Tubi TV and Pluto TV's profits. It's cool to see so many new creators develop now, especially with the multiple genres. The highlight so far this year is Stash Club Wrestling who take multiple quizzes to figure out who has better wrestling knowledge. They also have a podcast where they upload every week, with many commenting on their videos. Stash Club is owned by a larger company, but the hosts John and Dante put in a great amount of work towards the channel. Using several platforms, the channel has recently passed 47,000 subscribers. I wonder how much these two can expand the channel, and that's all up to them. Seeing YouTube change so drastically is crazy. I never would have thought that the one search I made would divert into a very long history with the site itself. Hopefully, the next 15, really, years is as great for the site. This is the last part of my history with uh, that I've been working on since last August. Thanks for watching all these videos. Can't wait to work on more.